Well, good morning, Southside, and special welcome. If you're visiting with us, we're glad to have you come uh, be a part of our body this morning. Um, last week, I uh, mentioned a, a need or a ministry that we were beginning, a community group, um, and just grateful uh, for the answer, the way you all answered. We have some nursery workers, some great people who volunteered to watch the babies, so these uh, young families can study the Word of God together, so pray for them. That starts, for those in it, that starts this Thursday, 6.30, uh, back here in the nursery. This morning, we're going to go back into our study through the book of Romans. If you'll turn to chapter 12, the theme of this book, I'm not ashamed of the gospel, it's the power of God for salvation to all who believe, to the Jew first, then to the Gentile, for in this gospel, the righteousness of God is revealed from faith to faith. And so we have been learning about this beautiful, powerful gospel, and now we are currently in chapter 12 looking at how does a, a justified uh, believer live? How does someone who's been saved live for the Lord Jesus Christ? And Paul is showing us that beautiful portrait. I love what Thomas reminded us, us in that song, is that the only sin that we can overcome is forgiven sin. And that's why there's a therefore, that's why the mercies of God in Christ, we are going to battle sin as sin that's already been forgiven because Jesus Christ hung on a cross in our place. That's the empowerment uh, for putting to death the deeds of the flesh. So we learned last week that in Romans 15, if we want true change, it's going to come through the Word of God, learning it, knowing it, understanding it, meditating on it with the Holy Spirit, attending it and applying it and showing us its truth and conforming us to what it's called, what God commands, Spirit, do, conform, make me and change me. So the Word of God and the Spirit of God. And so I don't want you just to get smarter through Romans 12. I want you to look more like Jesus Christ, to behold Him and become like Him. It's all by faith. Do not turn away to yourself. Turn to Him. Look to Jesus, it said in Romans 7. You're married to Him so that you might bear fruit for God. Keep living by faith. Keep going to Jesus for these fruits. And so we're looking at chapter 12. We have a general outline. The principle in verse 1 is to offer up your body as a living sacrifice to God. The response to this gospel is a whole-bodied presentation to God. And then we learned we're to dokomatsu, we're, we're to test and approve now what the will of God is. How do I be pleasing? How do I live? What, what is pleasing to this God? And the first section we moved into was humble, faithful exercise of the spiritual gifts that God puts within us to build up the body of Christ. And now we're in verses 9 through 21, looking then at more the, the practical life of love how do, we, how do we live before believers and unbelievers as we love God and love others? And so last week we saw that Paul began with this great fundamental principle. We called it a divine directive that is really the, the lead statement of this whole section now. <clears throat> In verse 9, let love be without hypocrisy. Let love be without hypocrisy. The more excellent way, agape love, this love that can only come from the Holy Spirit, no human will ever be able to produce agape love. And so it's, it's a love when God puts the Holy Spirit within us and we believe and receive Jesus Christ. There is a love that can be supernatural that, that all men can know you're his disciples because you have love for one another. And there's a way to quit being, wearing a mask and being fake and just trying to act out love. Walking in and saying, this is the performance that I do. This is what you're supposed to do if you're a Christian. This is now this organic, beautiful love flowing out of you because you've been joined to Jesus Christ. It's, it's otherworldly. You can't produce it. Only the Spirit of God can. Now this morning, we're going to take up Romans 9b. So 12, 9b. Let love be without hypocrisy. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Let's ask God to add the blessing to that word this morning that we will examine. Father, we come before you and I pray just by your spirit, illuminate these words now to, to the people in this room. God, for those who are at home live streaming, for those who are sick, God, take these words and use them mightily now in our lives. 
I pray that the fruit would be this deep love in every one of us that abhors what is evil and clings to what is good. God, deepen that in every heart this morning. For your glory, we do pray. Amen. Amen. So now uh, we begin our quest to dokimatsu, to, to look at what God wants, at this love that is real and genuine and not hypocritical. And the first thing we're going to learn is, is that when we love one another is we must be those who are poor what is evil and we cling or we cleave to what is good. And so this love is to be genuine. And that's what the gospel has done to us. And it's a pure love. But now Paul says it's also a principled love. It's a pure love. And so I was going to uh, do this statement in all of verse 10 this morning, but I, I just got stuck in it as I started studying and prayed. This statement is loaded. And the more I realized how full and rich it is and just how much, I just feel like we need to park on it as a body this morning and we need it to, to spring up deeper in our hearts. And so Paul starts out with one of the biggest issues in our day and time as, as you start to think. When, when you think about love, the kind of love that God wants from us, right away he says, it's about evil and good. Hating what is evil and loving what is good. And in this statement, there's just so much to guide us and help us in our love. It starts with the first question that's being asked on really, I think, a daily basis in our land. And it goes back to uh, was it Pontius Pilate or Herod, I forgot to look it up, when he says, what is truth? Anyone know the answer? Pilot. Who? Pilate. Pilate. That's what my notes say. So I, I got it right. Pilate. <laughs> so now, hot shot, what is truth? <laughs> I'll answer that after the service, right? <laughs> Is there objective truth? And this means that there's an absolute truth and truth that shares what is right and what is wrong demands absolute truth or is truth subjective where it's what I feel, it's what I think, it's what other people tell me. And so this is beginning, is there a standard of right and wrong? Is there good and evil? And how does one ever discern that? How do I know how to live my life? This verse is just so simple, but it gives us this huge world and life view as we begin. And so I was just thinking of all the young kids getting started. I wish someone would have told me this when I started. This needs to be important to you uh, youngins, because you're being hounded on a daily basis by the internet, school, friends, music, wh wherever you go, it just keeps coming at you like a fire hose telling you that there is an absolute truth. And there's such an attack on this verse and biblical thinking in our world that it's always been there, but there's an intensity right now like I've never seen. So how am I to think about all that's coming at me in this world with with subjective truth and lies? Do, do I need to read and stay up on all the teachings and the trends and the philosophers and read all the posts and the blogs? Because you can't. It, it just, you'd, you'd be at it. It's coming so fast, you can't keep up with it. So I, I just want to set you free this morning. No one can stay up with it because it's moving too fast. But the church is blessed that we have some scholars and amazing men and women who, who keep up with this stuff and keep us informed and write books. Thank you, Jesus. But I just can't keep up with it all. And so I love when I get a simple statement from God that is just, it clears the smoke and, and all the noise that's going on in this world and it boils it down simply so that I can love God and love this world without hypocrisy and be genuine and be real. One simple phrase. Here it is. <clears throat> Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. And what hits us immediately is, how can I do this? if good and evil are subjective? How, how, can I do, how, how do you hate what is evil if everybody's got a different definition of what is evil or if there even is something evil? You, you have your truth and I've got mine. No one can really know what is right or what is wrong. Everything's just relative is what we're being told. And, and unfortunately in the church, we're starting to drink it up like Kool-Aid. We're going back to the garden where the devil said, did God really say? 
and we struggle because some of us, we just know really nice people who have been nicer to me than many people in the church, which makes me sad. And they might have gender issues or pronouns or, or gay, whatever it would be, they're, they're so nice to me. You can't tell me that that's wrong. What difference does it make if they're not hurting anyone? I, I, why should that bother me? How can something so good be wrong? And so what happens is, is we have to change the truth of God and what he has said. And we can come up with really clever ways to change the truth. And we can say, you know, the Bible's so confusing. Dad, who, who can really understand it? It was written 2,000 years ago. It's just outdated. It's not relevant to where I live today. Uh, we can take texts uh, out of context and show why these sins are okay. I've been hurt by so many Christians that I don't care what's true in the Bible. I'm just glad somebody loves me. And I want you to catch this this morning. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. There's a sandwich. And I'm, I'm going to call it a, a love sandwich. Just love. L look at me at verse 9. Let your love be without hypocrisy. And then verse 10, be devoted to one another and brotherly love. And so you got agape, don't have a hypocritical love, have brotherly love for one another, and right in the middle, abhor what is evil. Somehow that's love. And they, they feed and they build off each other. And, and, and we see that hating evil and cleaving what, what is good has to do with love. And so we got to figure that out this morning. But what I want you to see first is that this statement demands objective truth. You, you must have it for God to command this. It it's, can't be subjective. It can't be what you feel, what you think, what you want it to be. If you're sitting here this morning in that place, I want you to let this hit you that it, it can't be that. The gospel is to change you. You don't change the gospel. So there's no way that you can abhor what is evil if the truth is subjective. That is evil for God to command that, and that would be unloving if the truth is subjective to hate what is evil when everybody's got a different definition. You, you can't command this unless there's an absolute truth to the creator of this universe that this is what is evil. And if it's subjective, this is an evil command. But if you're called to abhor it and cleave to what is good, there has to be objective truth that is right and wrong. And what is more, as I'll share later, it has to be what's best for you and what would harm you the most um, in good and evil with God. So God's definition, his standard of good and evil is what is best for his creation. It's how we were designed. It's how we work. He's not, these aren't to make you miserable. They're to make you happy. They're to bless you. It's God's design and orchestration. So it's not to make you miserable. If you're a young kid here and it's just miserable that my parents are making me think and live this way. And I want you to know that God's design is to, to bless you and to make you function the way he designed where you're going to be at your best joy and happy. So the, the, this absolute truth isn't to, to destroy you, it's to make you. I want you to see that this morning. So right out of the gate, there's objective good and objective evil defined by God. And it can't be defined by me. That repentance needs to take place if you're the one defining it. See, this could change some of you mightily this morning and help you truly love some image bearers of God. You can love people and not just say, hey, if it's good for you, you do you. You're not helping those people at all by saying, hey, go ahead. If it feels right, do it. I'll, I'll be your friend no matter what. I'm with you. I don't judge anybody. You're not doing them good. You're doing them harm. You're actually hurting them. And so I want you to, to look at how God's saying, I want you to, to be blessed. I want you to see there's absolute truth. And this is the best thing for image bearers. It's the best thing to bring to bear and to reveal and preach. That there's nothing better for humans than this. 
That's not love to say the other. It's hypocritical love. It wants to be accepted more than you want to help them eternally. I'll say that again. It makes you want to be accepted than to help them eternally with their souls with God. That's hypocritical love. That's using people instead of loving people. And that's what Paul's after here this morning is love. This could do so much for parents this morning. And I'm going to tell you that for 10 weeks, what this could do for parenting. Come, come to that class. So the question that should be in your heart then is what makes good good and what makes evil evil? <clears throat> it's just kind of stated here and it's not fleshed out. And so what I want you to do is stay in the flow of Romans with me. Romans 12, 2 do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you, you can prove what is the will of God, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So you can know the will of God, and Paul's flushing that out. And so the way that you will know what is good or evil will be the Word of God. The Word of God will tell us, God will reveal to us, image bearers, what is good and what is evil. Thank you, Lord. And so we just keep renewing our minds in truth and what God tells us and what is right and what is wrong. And so that I can abhor what is evil and love what is good. And that's the only place that we can ever get truth is the objective truth that we need to offer up our bodies a living sacrifice to God. We have to know what pleases Him. We have to know His will. And thank you, Lord, that you gave it to us. You revealed it in the Word of God. I treasure this. It's God's mind revealed to His creatures. And so I just want to park here this morning because absolute truth is from Creator God and it's being mocked and suppressed and ignored. Remember back in Romans 1, it said they won't give their minds to God. They, they tested Him, Dokimatsu, and they said, we don't want God in our minds. And they, they got rid of Him. They've twisted it. It has very little weight in our world. And we just play games with truth. And a verse like this comes and it starts cutting flesh off my heart that there's absolute truth. And God is telling us what His will is and, and we don't play with this. When truth is gone and everything's relative, you get what we're seeing in our country right now. You get Hitler's and Stalin's. And you get abortions being celebrated on live video. You get sex outside of God's design being glorified. You get Russia invading Ukraine. You're given over when you will not honor God and glorify His name. In Romans 1, there was a whole list of what comes out when we do this. So, what I want to do with our time this morning is I want to look at these statements, unfold them, and then we'll draw out some powerful applications that God has been doing in my own heart, and I pray He'll do in yours this morning. So look with me in verse 9b. Abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. Why this statement sandwiched between love? <coughs> it's, a call, it's a call to hate what is evil. And, and in, in our day and age, doesn't that feel like the opposite of love? It's definitely the, the way the world thinks about love. This is a big wrestling match what we're talking about the way many christians think today about love is unbiblical and so this is a great moment i'm challenging you to renew your minds to change this morning according to god's word and i don't think it's a, a natural transition here I, I don't think paul had a senior moment i think it's perfect paul is going to show you that a hypocritical love flows out of an impure heart Clean the outside of the cup, Jesus said, and the inside is still dirty and evil. And so love's got to flow from a, a pure vessel. It's an interesting connection that true, the true love of God abhors evil and clings to what is good. It hates what he hates and it loves what he loves. When you love God, you love what he loves and you hate what he hates. That's what happens in the gospel. You're made alive to God. So whatever God hates, I hate. Whatever God loves, I love. And that's what he's showing us here, to love others and do them good, abhor evil, love them, bring good to them, cleave to it. This is true love to do this. Paul, you're so right to go here. 
first. When Paul was writing Timothy to encourage that young minister, he said, Timothy, the goal of our instruction, our teaching, is love from a pure heart and a good conscience and a sincere faith. That's everything we're looking at in Romans. This is our goal, is love from a pure heart. If I had to summarize what Paul's going after, he's saying love burns best out of a pure vessel. Paul, with one phrase, is putting to death much of what is put up as love in the church today. This mushy, drippy sentimentalism with no concern for holiness and no concern for righteousness or just a, a raunchy legalism. This is it right here. Love flowing from the mercies of God that are in Christ Jesus that abhor what is evil and cling to what is good. No true love will flow best from one concerned for what God hates and loves. That is the best flow. Listen to Paul in 1 Corinthians 13, 4. Love is patient. Love is kind. It's not jealous. It does not brag and it is not arrogant. You remember how Romans 12, 3 began? It doesn't act unbecomingly. It doesn't seek its own. It's not provoked. It does not take into account a wrong suffered. It does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. It abhors what is evil and it clings to what is good. That's what love does. And we today are no, we, we just tolerate everything and anybody. We, nothing bothers us. We're just love machine. There's nothing. 1 Thessalonians 5.21 Paul said, examine everything carefully. Hold fast to that which is good and abstain from every form of evil. Amos 5.15, hate evil and love good. 3 John 1.11, beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but what is good. The one who does good is of God and the one who does evil has not seen God. Let's look at it. Abhor what is evil. The Greek word means to dislike utterly to have a violent hatred. One commentator said it's a revulsion that recoils. A revulsion that recoils at evil. This evil is this active opposition to God. <clears throat> and, and Paul's saying is, we don't play with it like a cat with a little ball of yarn. We don't say, I just want to see how close I can get to the cliff and not fall off. Can a man take fire in his bosom and not get burned? He's just calling us. We don't coddle it. And I have this old illustration that everyone who's been here over 10 years is going to say, oh, I've heard that too many times. And someone who's new is going to say, that was a really good illustration. (laughs) So first time I heard it, this guy said it was from him. And someone sent me a letter that said, no, it's a famous illustration. So I'm just going to use the illustration. I don't know where it came from. But there was this guy who went to Mexico, and when he was coming back, he just found this little dog that he just loved. And so he snuck it in his jacket. TSA wasn't as good back then. (laughs) And he he brings it home, and the whole ride, he's just kind of giving little kisses to his little chihuahua. And he's just loving it and petting it, and he gets back, and it starts to get sick. And he takes it into the veterinarian, and the veterinarian says, this is a Mexican rat. (laughs) <laughs> and it, the illustration's simple here's our sin he's so cute it's a Mexican rat recoil abhor what is evil we're a generation that kisses our little chihuahuas abhor it that's what love does it doesn't, lo- it doesn't love what God hates and hates what God loves and plays with it. Real love pours it. We must get this, that the world we live in tries to anesthetize us to it. It tries to package evil as normal, good, familiar. It pours perfume on it. It tries to make it acceptable. It wants to desensitize us to our love to God and others. It said, don't be conformed to this world. It's trying to get you to be okay with evil and not love what is good. It is working on a daily basis trying to do that. Evil will never benefit us. Guys, evil will never help the beloved of God. 
It will never be acceptable to God, that which is good and, and pleasing. If that's the fulfillment of the whole law, evil will never do either. It will do the opposite of both. In Isaiah, when he's condemning God's chosen people, the elect of God, why would God give over Israel? And he gives a list of some of the things they're doing, and the one is you're, you're reversing right and wrong, you're switching good and evil, you're changing it, and that's our culture. And I, I hate to say it, it, it's happening even in the church. And, and I pray that if I ever do that, you come up and shake me. Abhor what is evil, cleave to what is good. Go to Calvary and see the Son of God hanging, mocked, bleeding, and you see how much God hates evil. God hates it so much that he spared not his own son on a cross when he put that evil upon him. This is the fountain that will make our heart abhor what is evil and cleave to what is good, is, is Calvary's tree. Like, you can't look at that and say, I want some more evil. I abhor what that did to the Son of God in my place for me. And I cleave to what is good, the Lord Jesus Christ. So cling to what is good. And I, but before I move on to that, one last thing is, I abhor evil and sin, first and foremost, in my own heart. The hypocrite abhors it in everyone else. And you're, gonna, you're not going to have true love until it starts here. And I'm the greatest of sinners. That should be our argument. No, I'm the greatest. No, I'm the greatest. And when you see that and hate what's in your own heart, you can begin to love. And so I, we can't be hypocrites and point our fingers at everybody else. It just starts right here. And then we go out to love and help people to, to see evil and to see what is good. That's the gospel. Cling to what is good. This, I love this word for cling. It, it's kind of this idea of super glue where you take two, two pieces of wood and you glue them together. Fasten yourself to, to good. Be super glued together with that which is good so you can't be separated. Evil is wicked and ethically profane. The root word for evil is what we call the devil, the evil one. But good here is that which is just thoroughly moral. I love when the rich young ruler said to, to Jesus, good teacher, and he said, who's good? Only God is good. And so good is just God and what he makes good and defines as good. We read it this morning, Philippians 4, 8, finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there's any excellence in anything worthy of praise, let your mind be super glued to it, cleave to it, dwell on these things. Love what is good. The word is used here when Christ quotes it in Matthew 19. He quotes it from Genesis 2. In Genesis 2, Moses writes, For this cause a man shall leave his father and mother, <clears throat> and here's our word, and shall cleave to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. I want you to be wedded to what is good. And that's the best marriage there's ever been, is to be wedded and joined to Jesus Christ. Be joined to that which is good, forsaking all others, which is evil. And I will give myself unreservedly to that which is good. I've been given the good things of God, all of His grace, His excellencies, His word, His people. And when evil comes as a suitor, shut it down and say, I have another. I have a better lover, the Lord Jesus Christ, the, the good thing. So the excellent things in Christ and all of the blessings that flow, the fount of every blessing. Uh, it, and, and so turn from evil, but it's what you're turning to is Romans 1 through 11, the beauties of Jesus Christ. Turn to the fullness of the gospel, cleave to it, live in it, hold it, treasure it. Paul said, do you not know that the one who joins himself to a harlot is one body with her. For he says the two will become one flesh. But the one who joins himself to the Lord is one spirit with him. Be glued to Christ, the good shepherd. Cleave, be married to what is good.
abhor what is evil. Paul wrote to Timothy in 1 Timothy 6.10, For the love of money is the root of all sorts of evil. And some by longing for it have wandered away from the faith and pierced themselves with many a pang. But flee from these things, you man of God. Flee and pursue righteousness and godliness and faith and love and perseverance and gentleness. Pursue what is good. Timothy in 2 Timothy, flee youthful lusts and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Just Romans right there. So let's open this up and get to the heart of it. Are you, you, ready, to, are you ready to get to the heart of it? Yes. That felt like the heart of it, but we're getting in the heart of it now. This is what made me bleed all week. I want you to come join me. <coughs> so I want to open it up. So much of what is taught today is this. We're called choose against evil and choose for good. And I'm going to call this the religion of the will. I'm going to call it moral willpower is what is filling our land. And our churches are full of it, and it's why so many fall away and cling to what is evil. Why so little love flows from us? This is about agape and love, and this is, this is hurting us from the love that could flow. Why our love is hypocritical is look at me. I choose what is holy, and these people don't. I'm better. That's just hypocrite. You're just, make, you're just a big old hypocrite. J.C. Ryle said, don't, don't teach your kids that the world's so bad and evil. He said, let them know the worst evil dwells within their, their own heart. I don't drink, date, or chew, or go with girls who do. I'm better. And what that produces is self-righteousness, haughtiness, better than thou, shooting up everybody else. You're like, why can't I win anyone to Jesus? I, I shoot everybody and tell them they're wrong and I'm right. <laughs> why isn't that producing fruit? It, di- it just doesn't seem when, when sinful people walk into our midst and they, and they sit by you and you don't, you don't like it. I don't want my kids looking at someone like that. When I was a youth pastor, when I first graduated seminary, I had these ladies pull me aside Lovingly, I think. And they said, we're really concerned that you're trying to evangelize and bring all these kids into the youth group that we're trying to keep our kids from. That's where this leads. And maybe you've spent your whole life there. That's all that you've ever known is Christians do this and they don't do this. And I just, I just got my, my rule book. And I go around and I, I just keep it. And that's my religion. That's where it starts and that's where it ends for you. And I just want you to know that I love you and I care about you and I lived in that teaching for a while so I have so much compassion for you. But I'll tell you this, it never got me agape. The love that we looked at last week, I never got it. It left me crusty saying, I love people by telling them the truth. I tell everybody the truth. That's love. And you're, you know where I'm going. So come with me as I close. I want to rescue you this morning from that life if it's you. And I want to give you the fullness of joy and the true gospel. I want you to listen to these words one more time. Abhor. Cleave. And I want you to answer, what do those words mean to you? It's not choose what is good and reject what is evil. That's not what he's saying. These are very strong and intense words. You don't need to be an expositor to hear those words and say, those are pretty strong words. So I want you to hear this. And I know some of you are going to want to walk out after I say this. God does not just want you to choose right behaviors. The Pharisees were the kings of this. They chose right behavior all the time. The outside of the cup was really clean. 
They tithe mint and cumin. They, they would weigh out in their little garden these little pieces of mint and cumin, and this is how much I'm going to tithe. I'll tithe off my 10% of my little garden. Why, it says why you're, you won't even help your parents while they're in need. But you, you forsook the weightier things of the law like showing justice and mercy and love. And so your whole life is, I don't play cards. I don't dance. I'm at church every Sunday if it kills me. Mildred, I read the Bible every morning. I don't fight with my wife, at least not very often. I vote Republican, carry a gun. That's all it is. That is all it is for you. But when we start moving into what Paul is doing this morning, it makes you very uncomfortable, right? It just, you start getting uncomfortable because God wants your heart. He doesn't want just these behaviors with no heart. That was the whole Old Testament. I want your heart. You worship me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Jesus said, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. God doesn't just want behaviors, okay? He, he, he wants the heart. God wants a change of heart towards what is good and what is evil. I could set you free this morning if your whole life is just, I choose what's good and bad, and you're, you're just, you've never had a heart. It's just religion. Strong, passionate, emotive attitudes towards good and what is evil. And so my problem is this. If we don't just choose, abhor and cling to, how do I get my heart in line with what's being said here this morning? Because if I'm honest, and I want you to be honest with you and God this morning, I love evil. That's my problem. And I don't really like what is good. I do it because my parents taught me to. I just do it. And so if I love evil, how can I get my heart to abhor it? I, I can choose evil or good, but I, I can't make my heart abhor what is evil. And if I don't like what is good, how do I muster up and get my heart to cleave and want what is good? How, how can I ever fix this? And some of you might have come to church for decades and you're sitting here with that exact problem. I can't make my heart do that. And I'm the most frustrated, miserable person in the world because I just choose what is right and wrong and I'm in this miserable life and miserable battle because I don't desire any of it. But I do what is right. So that's the right question to ask. <laughs> how, can I do, how can I fix this? And Jesus told Nicodemus how to fix it. Nicodemus, you must be born again if you'll ever enter into the kingdom of God. You need your stony heart taken out, and you need God to put a new heart within that abhors what is evil and clings to what is good. This is the, the new heart religion, not the new behavior. And so it, I've never loved just behavior. He's always wanted your heart. And we're staring right in the face of it. A new heart has to be given to do this command. And that is the only way that this could ever happen because what is born of flesh is flesh. You'll never love what God loves and hate what he hates. You can't change your heart. And so I want you to listen to the promise that God made in the new covenant in Ezekiel saying, here's what I'm going to do. And he said this, Moreover, God says, I will give you a new heart, and I'll put a new spirit within you. I will remove the heart of stone that, that loves evil and hates what is good. I'll remove that stony heart from your flesh, and I'll give you a heart of flesh. And I'll put my Holy Spirit within you, and I'll cause you to walk in my statutes to love. And you'll be careful to observe my ordinances. And you'll live in the land that I gave you and your forefathers, so you will be my people, and I'll be your God. And I'll save you from all your uncleanness. 
and I'll call uh, for the grain and multiply it, and I will not bring a famine on you, and I will multiply the fruit of the tree and the produce of the field that you may not receive again the disgrace of famine among the nations. Then you'll remember your evil ways <coughs> and your deeds that were not good, and you will loathe yourselves in your own sight for your iniquities and your abominations. I am doing this for your sake, declares the Lord God. Let it be known. Uh, be ashamed and confounded for your ways, O house of Israel. I'll give you a new heart. This is the gospel of Jesus Christ. Quit trying to do what is right to be right with God. You can't change your heart. And so you look at the law and you just keep trying and making yourself be good enough and you just keep doing everything that you know a Christian's supposed to do but your heart can't change. So that's what we looked at last week is we're hypocrites because all we're changing is the outside and the inside isn't being changed. Quit trying to do what is right to be right with God. It's moving furniture on the Titanic because my heart won't do what this passage is calling for. This is why you want subjective truth. You want to change the truth because you, you know your heart hasn't been changed, so I need a standard that I can keep. And I'll change the truth so that I can reach it and feel good about myself and, and have easier things to do as a Christian. And I can say, look, I do that. I'm good. And, you, and you're changing the truth because you know you can't do what God's commanding here about a new heart. I can't get my heart to abhor what is evil and to love what is good. So I have to change truth to make the truth be what my heart likes and what it hates. i got to change God's definition of morality. I've got to change so that it fits what my heart really likes. Can I lead you to the only place that God has given for this miracle to happen? A new heart. And in John 3, when he said you must be born again, that he mentioned in, in uh, Numbers, when, when Israel is being bit by this serpent and they're all laying there dying. And God says to Moses, take a brazen serpent and lift it up. And anyone who looks at it that's dying from the serpent's bite and, and looks at it will be healed. And he said, Jesus said in the same way, the Son of God, the Son of Man is going to be lifted up on a cross. And we're laying here dying in our sin because we can't change our heart. We love what is evil and we hate what is good. And we're dying. He says, and the one who will just look at the cross of Jesus Christ and believe that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. That's the way to fix your heart. There's no other way that's ever been given but to look to Jesus Christ as the only remedy for that heart. And when you look and believe, he will do this heart transplant. And, and you will now love what is good. And you will abhor what is evil. Thank you, Jesus, for the transformation and being born again and the gift of God. Amen? Amen. And so if you're here and you've never done that, I do. I invite you to come talk to me afterwards. How to get a new heart. No matter if you've been in church 50 years, don't let it get in the way of being saved. And if, if you know all I got is these behaviors and I've never had a new heart, I want you to come and let's go in the back and cry out to Jesus for salvation. And then my dear brethren, I just keep learning at the beginning of, of this book, he said, the just shall live by faith. And so I want the, the Christian life is one of faith and repentance. And last week we looked at repentance and it starts with acknowledging that you've sinned against God to confess it, homo legeo, to be an agreement, the same logic with God. And so there, there might need some, some dealing with before God, I've been clinging to some evil things. I've been playing with evil. And my heart is just so cold to what is good because I've been eating so much at the table of the world, I've lost my appetite for God. And that's where we come this morning to repentance. And we quit. We, we, we said we confess forms of false repentance. 
where we say, I won't do that anymore. I'm going to work at this, God. I'm going to make you happy with me. This is the last time. Liar. False repentance. Quit bringing false repentance to God. And we come now, and, and we looked last week at when we come to repentance, it's changing the mind, the way you think, it, your behavior, getting to the root, mortifying it by the, by the Spirit. This whole thing is repentance. And now we got to discern and repent the underlying heart motivations that drive you to the sin. And now we got to look at the idols of, uh, I, I don't know if, you, if it's your, you, uh, you're always complimenting somebody because you're, the root is, I just want to be approved. I just want to be accepted. And deeper is, I'm not believing that I'm really accepted by the Trinity and in there. And so with sin, you got to drill. you got to go deep. I, I'm just finding just repentance of, I should have said that. Doesn't heal. It doesn't get very far. Get to the root of what the real problem is in your sin and, and bring that to God and confess it. And then cry out to God, uh, receive his forgiveness by faith. I can't say I grew up where, okay, I got to go pray three Hail Marys and two Our Fathers to feel better about my sin. I got to believe the gospel that he cleanses you when you confess your sins of all your unrighteousness. I'm going to live into the gospel. I'm going to receive your forgiveness and not try to do better tomorrow. And then you can forgive me. I'm, I'm going to believe the gospel. Confess. And he cleanses and washes me and restores me into fellowship. And then fifthly, we rely upon God's power to turn away from this sin by faith. I don't look to my own hands. I believe the gospel. The just will live by faith. And I, as I get to the root, the cure to every idol is faith. And it's believing the gospel. And it's living into it. And so I, I, I've got to say, God, empower me to overcome this. And, and as you do, I, I've had a bunch of you say, man, I had some growth this week in hypocritical love because I quit trying to do it and just me mustering up the strength, crying out to the Holy Spirit, believing the gospel. I am seeing God transform me. Yes. Yes. I'm going to shut up. <laughs> to God be the glory. And I want to be a church that because of this gospel, it's caused my heart to abhor what is evil. Not just have a distaste, recoil, a holy revulsion from that which is evil. And I want to be married and joined to Jesus Christ and the things that are excellent and good. And I, I pray that that's what real love is and that we would show that love to God and to one another. And with all my heart, I want to love you to abhor evil and to cling to what is good. And we help each other in the journey uh, to, 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 to grow in that kind of love uh, with each other. Let's pray. Father, make us a community that helps us to love without hypocrisy. God, let this gospel flow in our minds, our hearts, our wills. Lord, grow our hearts this morning as we look at the, the, the cross of Jesus Christ again and you remind our hearts universal together what he did for our sins. Make us abhor evil. Let us see what evil did to the Son of God. Let it see what it did to us groveling in this world and sin. God, let us not ever make friends with sin and evil ever again. Let it be a Mexican rat to every heart here this morning. Hate it. Abhor it. And Lord, let our hearts turn to the only one who is good. The Lord Jesus Christ, where we find life and godliness and help and sanctification and wisdom Jesus, let us cleave with all of our hearts to you and chase no other lovers. Lord, be the love of our heart. Be the supreme love. If we love anything more than you, we love it too much. God, do that in every heart this morning. Let love flow in Southside Bible Church, I pray in the name of Jesus Christ.